Thank you to Eric for those readings. Uh, hi everyone, my name is Tim and uh, I am one of the regular members of this church congregation, a congregation that I love and uh, I love our church so much, I love you guys so much and uh, it's a real privilege for me to be speaking tonight uh, about a topic um, that I'm very passionate about and is quite dear to my heart at the moment and that's overseas missions. Um, for those of you who don't know, uh, myself and my wife uh, Beck, we're actually leaving this church and we're leaving Australia um, and we're going to be moving overseas to Cambodia and we're going to be working at a school that supports missionaries, those who are taking the gospel to the nations. So that's a massive step for us. Um, tonight's a pretty big step for me. Um, my usual job is a teacher. I teach children um, and writing this sermon to preach to you has been a bit of an intellectual step up from that normal activity. Um, but with God's help, I trust his word will be working in shaping you all further. Uh, so I'm going to ask for God's help with that for me and also for you. So please pray with me. Dear God, we thank you that you are a powerful, mission-minded God. Thank you that you have given us direction in our lives. We pray, Lord, that you would reveal your heart for the nations through your word. That we too might be challenged to have our hearts in line with you. I pray that you'd help me to speak clearly tonight to explain your word to all of us. Amen. So, as I mentioned, I am a teacher. And uh, I really think that as a teacher, compared to all other professions... Teachers have probably got the best stories about work. Uh, in the home group that I run, we've got about four or five teachers, um, meaning that usually the chat prior to the study is just dominated with stories from the week, the crazy stories and the crazy things that are happening. Let me enlighten you with a couple of stories that I've enjoyed. Uh, it's school photo day. And there's a boy sitting there getting his individual school photo and the photographer's having a really hard time getting this kid to smile so hard, in fact, that he falls back off his chair. Now, the photographer held back some laughs, uh, and I went over to help the poor kid up. The photographer said, oh, that's, that's a new one for me. I've never had that before. Well, I got to the boy, and he said, I can't believe I did it again. The same thing happened to me in kindergarten. Or another time, uh, I was in my classroom getting ready for the day, and some girls came frantically knocking on the door, Mr. Kime, come out, help. I rushed outside to see that a boy had decided to do a science experiment on himself. He'd mixed blue food dye and water in his mouth. It was an interesting start to the day. He was all right. So was the other boy. Well, I was at a party a few weeks ago, and I was chatting to a friend I hadn't seen for a little while, and he's got a small connection in the school that, to the school that I work at. And being me, being a teacher, I started a story. Um, and he calmly and quietly just said, hey, Tim, I don't, don't really care about school stories. I wasn't too badly offended, maybe a little bit. Um, maybe he hadn't seen the light of how hilarious teacher stories actually are. <laughs> but just maybe his thoughts are similar to what yours might be towards caring about overseas mission. You might say, hey, Tim and Beck, like, I'm really glad you're going overseas. That's a good thing. Um, I'll even listen to your stories, but I'm not that interested in mission. Or maybe week by week when we celebrate what our missionaries are doing through the mission spot, we kind of tune out and think about something else and say, well, that's separate to what I'm here for. Well, tonight I want to challenge you to really care about mission because God cares about mission. To do that, we're going to have a look at what the Bible has to say about why mission is important and then apply by seeing what you can do to get on board with God's mission to take the good news of Jesus to the nations. So I'll repeat that. What we're going to do, we're going to see why mission is important to God and then secondly, we're going to see how you can get involved. By the way, if you're here tonight and you're not a believer, I'm really excited that you're here. Um, great that you can participate in our service tonight. Um, I just pray that you might be able to, to stick with me going through some big ideas and some big themes and that through the, serv the sermon tonight, you might be able to see the immense love that God has for all people 
around the world. Well, that takes me to my first point. Why should overseas mission be essential to every believer? Because God's heart is for mission. God's heart is for mission. Joel wrote out what's known as the Great Commission before, where Jesus told his, his disciples to go and make disciples of all nations. Now, some people think that that idea, what Jesus said there, was really an afterthought to the, what he was really doing with his ministry. I'll try and give you an illustration that might help you bring out what this false idea might look like. One title that I'm really happy that I've never had to endure is being an apprentice. I don't know how many of you have been an apprentice. I hear it's not great. You get the most tedious jobs, you're the butt of all jokes, and when you do finally get to do something, if you don't get it right, you're going to cop it and you'll never get another opportunity to do it again. Now, one story I remember hearing was on a work site, and this work site was a uh, multi-storey building, and they were up to the eighth storey. And the only way to get up to this work site in the morning was obviously to walk up the scaffolding. And you had to take all your tools for the day. Um, if someone forgot something, then they'd have to climb all the way back down and get their tool or whatever they needed and come back up. However, when the apprentice was on site, you beauty, send the apprentice down, him or her would be going down, get the tool and then come back up. Imagine if you would that Jesus was an apprentice and the father sitting up at the top of the site needs something done at the bottom. He sends the apprentice down and after getting the important item, doing what he needed to do, the boss has a clear understanding of how this building should be made and just yells out, hey, tell everyone I've changed my mind. We're going to change everything. We're not doing it that way anymore. The new instruction was an afterthought. There's an idea that Jesus' message to the disciples, the Great Commission, was an afterthought. Now, this isn't a perfect illustration, but I think it can be translated into a false understanding of God's intention behind the Great Commission. That the Great Commission of Jesus was nearly, nearly tacked on to the end of his ministry. What I think the Bible says quite clearly is that God has always had a heart for the nations, from the very beginning. The nations, what that word means, it's simply those who are overseas or over borders. Or in biblical terms, it's those who are not God's chosen people. He has always wanted these people to be his. To see this, what we're going to do is have a fairly broad stroke of the Bible. I've picked out a few key passages from the Bible to really show how God does love all nations and want them to be his. We're going to start in the book of Genesis. So if you've got your Bibles, you can have a look at Genesis chapter 12 and we're going to look at verse 3. And it says this, And I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you I will curse, and all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now, this is part of what's called, what's known as Abraham's covenant or the Abrahamic covenant. And pretty much what that means is it's God's deal or God's promise with a guy in the Bible named Abraham. The greater context behind this is there are three great parts to this covenant. One, that God's going to give him land. Two, that God's going to give him lots of descendants. And three, that God's going to bless him. And these three are considered the backbone of the covenant. But what's sometimes forgotten is the important second half of the last blessing. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. Now God blesses Abraham. He gives him this, this blessing. And the intended outcome of this blessing is that other people would be blessed. And not just others. He says very clearly, all people will be blessed. The covenant with Abraham, who would one day be considered the father of all Jewish people, was meant to be to bless all. It was not meant to stop at Abraham getting blessing and just saying, hey, thanks God. God intended it to reach out to all the nations. 
Our second reading tonight came from Psalm 67. And here I think the author really encapsulates the idea of what the Abrahamic covenant is meant to mean. Now this, is, this was written in the time of David, uh, who was a descendant of Abraham. He was the earthly king of Israel. And it was the nation, he was living in the nation uh, known as Israel, living in that land that God had promised Abraham back in that covenant. So this is Psalm 67. May God be gracious to us and bless us and make his face shine on us so that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation among nations. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. For the nations, may the nations be glad and sing for joy. For you rule the peoples with equity and guide the nations of the earth. May the peoples praise you, God. May all the peoples praise you. The land yields its harvest. God, our God, blesses us. May you bless us still so that all the ends of the earth will fear him. I really love that, those words in verse 1. They're such beautiful language. Make his face shine upon us. You might have heard them if you've been a Christian for a little while at a wedding or maybe at a, a baby's dedication or something like that. But the essence of what the author wants here is for those blessings to continue. He wants us, Israel, to continue to be blessed by God. He wants to continue to feel the warmth of that blessing from God that extends back to Abraham. But why does he want this? Well, verse 2 says, So that your ways may be known on earth, your salvation amongst the nations. Do you know, too many times I've just read verse 1. I've read verse 1 and I've said something like this to God. Dear God, thanks for smiling down on me. Thanks for all the great blessings you've given me. Thanks for an awesome church, God. Thanks so much for a great house. Thanks for Wollongong. What a great city to live in, God. Thanks for my wife. Thanks for my job. Thanks for my friends. And God, keep it coming. I love it. Please keep it coming. Full stop. Why would God want to give me this? Why would he actually want to answer such a vain prayer like that? Why does he choose to bless us? Why did he keep his covenant with Israel? It's so that, verse 2, his name may be known. It's so that, verse 7, all the ends of the earth will fear him. It's so that others might be blessed. So we can sum up this idea of God giving blessing like this. We are blessed to be a blessing to others. We are blessed to be a blessing. In Israel's case, bless the nations. In our case, to bless those who are not yet in God's kingdom. Can you see the heart of God for the nations here? Well, we can be sure that God's heart is for the nations. And to be sure of that, we want to look at the perfect image of God. We want to look at Jesus. I've picked a passage in the, um, the book of Mark, chapter 11, verse 15 to 17. Uh, a bit of context here. Jesus has just come to the temple, the place that is at the centre of Jerusalem. And uh, he is going to be doing some things in here. Let's have a look. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves and would not allow anyone to carry merchandise into the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, Is it not written, My house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it into a den of robbers. Well, there's a couple of reasons why Jesus is so upset and so angry here. It's probably the, the point where we see Jesus at his maybe most emotional. Um, one reason was that they had turned this great place of God's into a marketplace. He was upset about that. But can you see why else he was angry? 
Now, the place where these markets were taking place was supposed to be the area where the Gentiles were allowed to go. A Gentile is someone from the nations, not a Jewish person. This was meant to be a place where the nations could access God, where they could see the light that the Israel, the, the Israel was supposed to be. But what had happened in this place? It was corrupted. It was full of money grabbers, people seeking their own good and having no thought at all for anyone else other than themselves, especially not the nations. Well, what was Jesus' response? It's righteous anger. Righteous anger, knowing that these people had gotten in the way of the nations accessing God. That his father's heart's desire was not being satisfied because his chosen people were not obeying him. God has always had a desire to bring the nations back to himself. His heart, his love, his desire is for the nations to have the gospel shared with them. If we go forward to the, the end of uh, the Bible in Revelation, we, we come to a point of the time in the future where Jesus is reigning on the throne. And there it's written, we know at the end of time, every tribe and every nation will stand before Jesus and be part of his kingdom. So not wanting anything to do with mission as a Christian is like being on a team but not knowing the overall game plan. It's to not understand the eventual goal and how to get there. God's plan for the nations runs through the whole Bible. But how are we meant to get on board with this plan? Well, quick recap from what I've just said. Firstly, God's heart has always been for the nations. Secondly, my second point, why should overseas mission be essential for every believer? Well, you should care because Jesus showed us how to do it. You should care because Jesus showed us how to do it. I don't know how well you remember the, the fourth grade. I've been teaching you four for five years. Uh, and there's one thing that I never feel I teach enough, although it is very monotonous, and that's times tables. Um, special shout out to any mathematicians in the room. You've been neglected for too long. This is an analogy using maths. Um, some kids, they get times tables. They just get it. They understand it. They can do it. They know every times table back to front. You give them one, quick as anything, they know how to do it. And then there's the others. I give them a variety of different strategies. Write it out. Use the flashcards. Here's a times tables app on an iPad. I'll teach you a song even. And there's still a lot of difficulty in remembering them. If you don't get times tables, then maths is pretty hard from there going into high school. And you know what? Jesus... He saw the importance of multiplication. He knew it was the way to reach the nations. Matthew 28, 18 to 20. We've already had it read tonight. I'll read it again. Then Jesus came to them and said, All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Therefore go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded. And surely I am with you all the way to the end of the age. Well, firstly, Jesus states that he has all authority given from the Father, and by that highest authority, we are to take the good news of the gospel to the nations. And secondly, he says, go. And this shouldn't be used as an imperative sense. It's not meant to be like that or a command. Rather, it should be interpreted to say, as you go... Make disciples. Making disciples seems to be where Jesus really gets how important multiplication is. A disciple is different from a convert. A convert is a word that Christians I think quite wisely. We don't use it that much um, nowadays. A convert is simply someone who just changes their religion. They go, okay, I accept God now. But a disciple is someone who wants to proclaim Jesus' name and seek to obey their teachings, his teachings. 
they will seek to multiply the kingdom. They will make disciples who will make disciples who will make disciples. Have you ever thought why Jesus didn't just choose to bring on the kingdom solely or by himself? How could he disciple everyone? He had his hands full getting 12 people to try and follow him. And simply converting people to follow him would not last for generations. But with the power of multiplication, Jesus sees how his name is to be made known around the world. This is, explains why Jesus spends so much time training these disciples. He knew that once he returned to the Father, that they would carry on the work, making disciples in the same way that he had discipled them. Now you might say, wasn't there just 12 disciples? Like, how much of an impact could they have actually made? I think the next slide will show you the impact of what these 12 disciples were actually able to do. They took the word of God to the nations, the good news of Jesus to the nations. If you culminate that with Paul, who was Jesus' chief instrument in taking the gospel to the Gentiles, then a significant part of the known world was told the gospel in the first century. Disciples making disciples making disciples. <clears throat> this is why missionaries, when they go overseas, they need to set up in one place and share the gospel with those peoples. The growth of that church in a new indigenous culture, with indigenous believers sharing their faith with their own people, is integral to disciples being made. It's not this go from one place, share the gospel, okay, I think we've done it, move on. Discipleship is where this is most important. As I mentioned, Beck and I were going to be missionary teachers. Um, and it's a slightly weird role in the sense that we're not on the front line and yet supporting these parents in what they're doing for the gospel is, is vital. If their kids can't be given uh, quality Christian education, then they might have to go home and the gospel can't be shared. You know what? I can't wait to be able to share with you all the great things that these families are doing for the gospel in Cambodia. To share with you how the support that you're giving us is going to allow the gospel to go out. It's going to be great. So, why should we care about overseas mission? Well, firstly, God cares deeply about it. He cares about the nations. Secondly, Jesus shows us how to do it. Now I want to get a little bit practical about how you can be supporting overseas mission right here. Lastly, I want to say that you should care about overseas mission because God wants to use you. When I was 19, uh, I'd just come back from England. I'd been teaching at a school over there on a gap year. And whilst I was there, I chatted with a friend um, about my plans for the future. And uh, at the time, I thought the university would be a bit of a waste of time. Uh, I didn't really think it was an option for me. But what I did think of was that I could be a missionary, something that I could do really good for God and that God would use me. That's what I thought it was going to do. I decided that without too much prayer, uh, sorry, without much prayer, I decided that I was going to go and work in Hong Kong. I was going to work at a, a home for boys who were struggling with drug addiction. It was a pretty honourable thing to be doing. Um, the support network that was there in Hong Kong was fantastic. I thought, I want to be part of that. That looks great. God's going to use me. When I came back to Australia, I had some serious conversations with uh, people in my church and people uh, in my family. And the overwhelming response was that this wasn't such a good idea. Well, I argued back, what are you talking about? Surely this is a good thing for me to do. God's going to use me. That's the place to be, overseas, being used by God. Finally, a, a strong Christian man in my church recommended that university would be a good option for me, that I would grow as a Christian and I'd be able to serve. I trusted him and with a few restless weeks of prayer and a few deals with God, I ended up enrolling at the Woolong University of Wollongong. Now, what's that got to do with mission? Well, I don't think I understood how God could use me here in Australia. I didn't understand 
that there were things I could do to further the kingdom without actually going to the mission field. Uh, Final reading came from um, Acts chapter 1. I'm going to focus specifically on verse 8. It says, "You You will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem and all Judea and Samaria and to the ends of the earth. What Christ calls us to be is a witness for him in all nations. That means that this nation, Australia, that means in this nation, Australia, uh, with the different people groups who are here, and it means witnessing for him in other nations as well. What I want to do tonight is suggest five ways that you can be a witness for Christ, for what Christ has done, both here and overseas. Two of them were mentioned by the short-term mission team getting up here tonight, so I'm glad they mentioned those two. So the first one is prayer. I was recently talking to uh, a man in our church whose name's Warwick. Uh, Him and his wife are what I would deem prayer warriors. For 55 years, they've been holding a prayer meeting in their house for the work of a particular missions organisation. I think that's pretty incredible. 55 years, that's twice my lifetime. Um, And the work of this organisation continues to flourish and it's through God's steady hand and those who are seeing his vision and committing it to prayer that good things are happening. Um, Paul, who I mentioned before, on his first missionary trip, he and another guy, whose name was Barnabas, were sent out of a church in a place called Antioch. The church there were praying that they might be able to send someone and continue praying when they actually did send them. Do you know, this is a massive thing for Beck and I. As a missionary couple being sent out of this church, we know that we will be prayed for. We know that we're going to be prayed for in good times and we know we're going to be prayed for in hard times. And we know that prayer is going to get us through. We need God. We need your prayers as well to help. And all the people who are missionaries need those prayers as well. The second one is write. Now, there's a famous missionary by the name of William Carey. Some of you might have heard of him. And he was sent to India in the year 1792 by an organisation out of England, and he stayed there until he died. India at the time was just slowly starting to be understood by God, uh, by Europeans, and William and a few who travelled with him were under immense stress, uh, sickness and difficulty. But he wrote to the people back in England who supported him, and those communications were really important. And the people in England, they wrote back. But I wonder what would happen if they just didn't write back. Can you imagine the sheer isolation of being on a separate continent and the sadness of packing up and leaving and then to feel supported but then not have anyone write back to you? You know, I think this is a really key thing for us to discuss. We live in an age of incredible communication where we can talk to missionaries, we can write to them and we can encourage them. However, maybe like me, I think you've been stuck in this idea of uh, what I call the seen on Facebook mentality. I saw the, the newsletter from the missionaries. Uh, I saw their prayer points. Um, I saw their Christmas update. But that's all I did. You know, if we're in partnership with these people, these people who are on the front line who've left to go and support God's work, to take the gospel to the nations, then we can participate by doing something really simple, which is them knowing that we are partnering with them by writing to them. Send them an email. Maybe you're new to our church, um, you've been here for a little while and you don't know them and say, hey, I'm new to the church, you're a, a missionary partner, that's great, just letting you know that we're praying for you. I think that would be so encouraging to be um, receiving that email. You can tell them about your home group and the things that you're learning in your home group. You can tell them about what you know about their country, ask them questions. Tell them that you support them and that you love them. Number three is give. Uh, If you're at home group this week, you would have seen that we have quite a number of missionaries that we do support and we support them financially. 
And our church is a good sending church. Uh, We delight in being able to send missionaries and we delight in being able to partner with them. Um, Currently, out of all the money that is given to the church, about 9% of that money goes to mission works. As an average of what churches give globally, uh, we're giving a lot more than most. However, financial support for missionaries is often something that's hard to come by. Maybe you consider giving generously out of your blessing so that the nations can hear the gospel. Well, number four is go to the nations in Australia. Do you know, we're regularly hearing that Australia is a melting pot of the nations, and I think it's completely true. You can engage with people from different nations right here in Australia. So be willing to cross cultural borders in order to make friends with these people. Understand that despite living in Australia, they may have a different way of doing things and you'll have to understand that culture. But do that by starting a conversation with them, chatting with the person who lives in the same building as you, who you know is from a different nation. Make them feel welcome. Invite them into your home. Learn their name. Invite them to church or discover. Share the gospel with them. You know, we should be the forefront We should be at the forefront of welcoming different nations into our country. Imagine the blessing that they might receive as that one person who stepped across that cultural border to share with them. And finally, I want to say a way that you can support mission right now is to consider going overseas. Start thinking about maybe working in a different culture. Any mission-minded person will be able to tell you a few statistics. This is the one that I think is most harrowing for me. There's 2 billion or so people currently living in the world who have no access to the gospel. No access. They know no Christians. There's no church near them. The Bible may not be in their language or the Bible may not be available. And only 10% of mission workers are actively working to decrease that number of unreached people groups. So maybe examine how God has been equipping you as a Christian. See how he's been equipping you intellectually and socially. And ask yourself honestly, am I willing? Am I willing to go? Am I able to go? It was great to see the short-term mission um, trip up here sharing with what they're going to do. Maybe that's something you want to consider in the future. Maybe find another organisation that are running a short-term mission trip. You know, these decisions, they're not ones to be taken lightly. Um, Beck and I just didn't decide overnight that we wanted to go overseas and work at a missionary school. Uh, it's been at least since our marriage and probably before our marriage that we were thinking of it. I was talking to another guy who's a missionary in Thailand. For him, it was seven years after he said, I'm willing and able to eventually ending up where he thought worked best for him. Do you know, ultimately, we just want to be like Jesus. Jesus who left his father's side to come to a new culture, one that he'd made but hadn't been in. And the blessing of Jesus coming to the earth has passed through the generations and has led to us sitting here tonight, being blessed through him. We see how when he died, God's own heart was broken by being separated from his son. But that broken heart was brought about because of God's own desire to have all people restored to him. You know, if you're not a Christian here tonight, then that's really the essence of the gospel, that God loves you so dearly that he'd send Jesus to die for him, die for you, that he'd send that, for, send that for all people, that he'd go through that brokenheartedness so that other people could be restored to himself, that Jesus was risen from the dead to prove that he is Lord. Do you know, I hope you respond to that tonight. I hope all people will be able to respond that we can start praying We can write to encourage the other missionaries that we can give, that we can go to the nations both here and 
uh, around the world. So will you pray with me, please? Our Father God, we thank you that our heart, your heart is for the nations. We thank you, Jesus, that you provided the perfect example for us to do mission. Lord, we ask that you would use us. You'd use us here in Wollongong through our prayers, our communications and our giving that we might be a blessing to all nations. Amen.